Um, this is our weekly session that the library hosts. And we host this because we see it as an extension of our library's charge to promote freedom of access to information and ideas. So whether or not you agree with every single thing that you'll hear today or that you find on our shelves or even up here, these books that you can check out on the topic we're going to be discussing today, we want everyone to have access to those so that they can learn from different perspectives. So we, um, we ask that you are respectful of everything that is said. And if you have your opinion, we want to hear it. And we just want to make sure that we have a good scholarly conversation that um, keeps in mind that your opinion may not be everyone else's opinion. So we want to respect everyone else's opinion, too. At the end of this discussion, I'm going to ask you to fill out a really short survey to see what you liked about the session, what you didn't like, how we can improve so that we can keep these sessions relevant for you. So we have students, faculty, staff members, community members come in and host these sessions. So if you are passionate about an issue and you'd like to host a session, come talk to me and I'll be happy to get you on the schedule. So we're almost full for next quarter, but there are a couple spaces left. Um, so if you're interested, please do come talk to me. So next week um, will be our final COSI for the quarter and it will be with Seattle Central student Owen Salison and he'll be discussing justice for sale, how the for-profit prison system is bankrupting society. So if you're interested in that, please join us. But this week, please join me in welcoming Dr. Valerie Hunt, who is a faculty member in the ABS program. And Dr. Hunt's research and doctoral work is on US immigration policy. And today's discussion will be called Immigration Reform and what it means to citizens and denizens in Washington State. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hunt. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm going to read a little bit just to make sure I uh, cover some things as well as um, to make sure that those who will be watching this on YouTube and on our website, that's right, we, we have the COSI lectures and the conversations on the library website now. So we want to make sure that for our future audiences they'll be able to follow us. So as I said, I'm, I'm excited to facilitate this conversation about U.S. immigration policy reform and what it means to citizens and denizens in the state of Washington. Now here's a bit of an overview of the information we'll cover and the things that we're going to address today. I'm going to provide you some information about the general contours of U.S. immigration policy and decision making. And then we're going to discuss the particular issues fueling U.S. immigration policy reform debate. And then I'm going to provide you a demographic picture of migration into the United States, into Washington State, and into the Seattle area. And then we're going to talk about the reform measures and debates that, and what they look like here in Washington State and Seattle, and what this means for Washington citizens and Washington denizens. But first off, I want to explain to you why I wanted to lead the conversation, or at least facilitate the conversation today about immigration reform. Back in 1994, when I was living in uh, California, I was working for the Commission on the Status of Women, and I was sort of, well, I was working with the Commission on the Status of Women, and I was also working with refugee families from Russia, or the former Soviet Union at that time, um, Guatemala, Ethiopia, and, uh, let's see, uh, Nicaragua. And at that time, there was a spike of migration and in California, and a big debate as to whether these new migrants were welcome in the state of California. So in 94, the citizens of the state of California, through Proposition 187, voted to prohibit unauthorized migrants from having access to public education, medical care, and other services. Now this part of the issue is well known. But what is not well known is that a part of that debate and part of that law, um, well the proposition was that those children who were born in the state of California of parents who were unauthorized migrants. The proposition wanted to make these children, these US, newly born US citizens, to be stripped of their citizenship. Now, US citizenship by birth is a constitutional right. So this tells us that the debate was around some issues, not just about social services, it was around the notion of being and belonging. Pretty much the notion of being a belonging that has surrounded all new migrants who have come to this country. And so this struggle resonated with me for the past 20 years. So I want to set the stage to clarify our working definitions 
uh, so that we can revisit them as we move along. I'm going to talk about reform, denizens, and citizens. So reform, this is Webster's Dictionary, but I don't know, get to that one quickly, mm -hmm. rather than a lot of the scholars that uh, spend their time coming up with notions about reform. <coughs> reform is the act of making changes in order to improve something, not just to change, but then change for what is considered to be an improvement. The second one is citizen. This is a person who legally belongs to a country and has the rights and protections of that country. But this is where it gets a little murky and a little ambiguous and a little fractious. It's the notion of denizen. A denizen is a person who lives in a place. But a person who not only lives in that place, that person also can claim membership in that place. So what we mean by that is that a citizen is a denizen, and a person who is not a citizen is a denizen. We start wrestling about what does it mean to belong? Legal considerations of belonging? Historical considerations of belonging? Or that you belong because we're all human beings and the land is underneath our feet. <laughs> So with that, um, that's where we're going to have a little bit of our conversation, our truthful conversation. So immigration has always been a story about being and belonging. Whether it is a story of the European migration into the Americas, a migration that sparked the struggle between Native Americans and all immigrants over land, culture, place, and identity. It is also the story of the Great Land Annexation under 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, where the United States annexed, after a war, over 500,000 square miles of what is now California, Arizona, Colorado, some of Wyoming, and New Mexico. I might have left out a state or two here. But as our brother, Sherman Alexie, who is native, poet, and scholar, he says, let's get one thing out of the, out of the way and in the open. Mexican immigration is an oxymoron. Mexicans are indigenous. He said this in 2012 in the aftermath of this Arizona State Passage of SB 1070, when Mexican immigration was considered an invasion into land that they never been in. So it's also a story about forced migration of African peoples who were kidnapped enslaved in a new country, and their descendants' struggle of being and belonging in the United States' social, economic, and political life. And this is evidence in establishing the separate but equal doctrine in the Dred Scott decision in 1857, then the legal demise of that separate but equal decision with the Brown v. Board, I said legal demise, <laughs> real demise. And then the struggle we see now of black lives mattering and have always mattered, but we're, we're debating that as sparked by the events in Ferguson. And immigration reform is also a story of the lost boys and girls in South Sudan and in many other places who have found their way to the United States and also to here in Seattle. One person in particular I want to bring up and lift up to our attention is my brother Jok Mio who's one of my students from Seattle University. I want him to come and talk to us sometime. He's about 24, 25. He was a lost boy, lives here in Seattle, and he founded a or nonprofit organization called The Lear. Just put it up here so y'all can see it. It's The Lear Project, which is a nonprofit organization to support the education of young children in South Sudan who are Trying as, trying as they might to be able to um, have some humanness in their lives after the war and challenges in South Sudan and in Sudan. So what does this tell us? We human beings move into spaces and places that are unfamiliar to us and where we are unfamiliar to the people who have come before us. Wherever we move, wherever we are, we're human beings who want to be and who want to belong. Now, how does our collective endeavor, our collective story, 
of being and belonging play out in U.S. immigration policy? Well, there are three areas where the, the federal government and the states struggle. One is, who can be here and for how long? That's what some of the policy is around. Who can be here and for how long? And then the second one is, what can you do or what can a migrant or a newcomer do or not do while they're here? I'm going, because I like to be interactive, it's so hard for me to lecture. I'm going to ask you your name. Sabima? Okay. When someone's here and we're thinking about what they can do, what are one of the things that a person might be able to do if they were to move here from another part of the world? What are the, one of the things that we might want that person to be able to do? I'm sorry? Following the rules? Yeah, that means you have to know what the rules are, right? Well, if you want to belong, you might want to follow the rules, and then after you learn them, some of my colleagues here might say, then you might want to change the rules. <laughs> I knew that was what was your next one. You might want to change the rules. The other one is that you might want to work here, right? Mm -hmm. So who can come here? How long can we stay? Can we or can we not work? Can you buy property? Can we buy property? Do you access services? Can we access services? This may fall under change the rules, but can we vote? That is it. That's one of them. Can we vote, which allows for us to change the rules, mm -hmm. and also allows for us to have a certain measure of decision-making um, right and responsibility. Yes, sir. Freedom of speech. And freedom of speech begins here. Y'all remember this one? which we used when we were, when Occupy was in town? Mm -hmm. Well, we got our freedom of speech badges. Freedom of speech, yes. Can we speak? Education. Can we get an education? Can we go to the doctor? Can we go to the doctor? How much taxes do we have to pay? And I, how much taxes we have to pay? Absolutely wonderful. Because what you think might happen is that if I pay some, maybe I'll get, be able to reap the benefits of that collective endeavor. So some of us might want to be able to reap the benefits of paying taxes. How much to pay and can you get? Can you marry who you want? And can you marry who you want? Thank you, because that's who we want to marry. I wonder what this is going to look like on YouTube. My students always say that they can't read that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, Valerie, also, can you leave? Can you leave? And come back. Um, leave and come back, because yeah. some of us have families, and we want to visit those families, mm -hmm. and we also want to be able to come back. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a matter of who can be here, can they leave, and can they come back? And the last one that I really want us to focus our attention on is can we become members, and to what degree can we become members of our new community? Being able to vote is one way of being a member. But that's not all. As we well know, those who are, have experienced being a part of the, the criminal justice system, rightfully or wrongly, when, if, it, if a felony is a part of that process, you can lose what is really most precious about following the rules and changing the rules, your right to vote. So, since 1965, I'm not gonna give you a whole long history about uh, immigration law, but just wanna point some things out to you. U.S. immigration has been founded on unifying families, going to visit families, going to be able to come back, going to visit the person who you want to marry. Maybe taking the ashes of your family member back for historical, because that's part of your custom, and then coming back. Allowance of workers with different skills and abilities, and we also have seen since 1965, which was the main um, Immigration and Nationality Act that allowed for these um, provisions. It provided a safe haven for those facing religious, sexual identity, and political persecution. Now, we've had some wrestling back and forth since 1965 
But we say deeply that family reunification should be the bedrock of U.S. immigration policy. And then if you are reunifying families, you want those families to be able to have a living, have uh, and, and secure all of the benefits and rights and responsibilities of, of being a part of this community. And that would mean getting an education, being able to accumulate wealth, and sell your property, buy property, sell property, as you were saying, John. So reform indicates that the status quo is not working. Status quo is not working. It's not viable and requires fundamental change. So we want to think about what are some of the current problems that are with, with the extent U.S. immigration law that are what well, we're hearing calls for reform. Well, one of them is the notion of there are backlogs of legal immigration visas for those who are attempting to reunify their families. Another one is the notion of stemming the tide of unauthorized migration. I choose my words not uh, uh, to be politically correct. I'm an immigration scholar. And um, I was trained in political science, but my real consideration, deep consideration, are the ethical, political, and social dimensions of our legal process. And so, we who, um, um, I and my colleagues use the word unauthorized intentionally. Documents, you could have documents still not be considered uh, eligible to be in this country. Uh, you can, and you, we don't believe that, that one can be illegal. There's illegal behavior, but people are not <laughs> illegal. But you may be here unauthorized. So there's simply the tide of unauthorized migration. It might not mean that we have people who are coming in, because it sounds like hordes of people moving across, as we saw with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, a border that might just shift on you overnight. What we're speaking to is that in families, migration status can change swiftly. You can have a person who is a full member, and two days later, another person who's a full member, uh, her status changes because her visa changed. So now all of a sudden, that person is unauthorized. So we need to figure out how to address uh, what it means to be authorized and unauthorized. Right now, we have it's estimated that we have 11.3 unauthorized migrants in the United States and 214 in the state of Washington. So what I want to do before we go any further is give a little bit of um, uh, stats or demographic data about who's here in Washington, United States, and in in the uh, Seattle King County area. So we have 316 million persons in the United States above ground. <coughs> Then we have 441 million who are migrants. That's 13% of the total US population. We haven't seen that number since the early part of the 1900s. Now, if we would take a, a different take at this and say, of those 41.3 million migrants, if we were to include them with their families who might be citizens, then that, that number goes up to 25%. 25%. Here in the state of Washington, you know, 5,000, close to 6,000, I mean 6 million people, 13% of our population is foreign born. Foreign born means naturalized citizens, legal permanent residents, unauthorized, then uh, residents, students, and workers on visa. In the Seattle metropolitan area, which is Seattle, Tacoma, Bellevue, if y'all want to spend some time talking to me at another time, I'll talk to you about all of the counties and where people are. But we wanted to talk about just here. We have about 3 million people in the area. Oh, no, we're not in the area. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we have, for immigrants from all of the countries in this area, 591,000. That's 16.9% of everyone who lives in this area. So migration and newcomers and old timers, this is a major concern for us. <coughs> Let me break it down a little bit more for you. Let's look at these counties. King County, let's see. Well, there's a comparison by state, county, and the US. 
We have 40 million people in the United States. These are the top counties that have migrants. 407 and 800,000, 407,800 in King County. It's no Homish County. Do y'all know where some of these counties are? This is Pierce, right? This is Thurston. Help me out, John. Snohomish is the top one. Where Snohomish is here. Pierce is here. And then Pierce. Pierce is here. And then Thurston is which one? It's either here or here. Okay, you people who have their smartphones, tell us about it. This is Whatcom. Where's our smartphone folks so we can figure out which one is up? It's so horrible that we don't know which one. These are our neighbors, all right? Where is that kid's at? Okay, this, is, this right here is Thurston, isn't it? And that's Pierce. This is Pierce. Yeah, that's Pierce, yeah. And then which one of these is Thurston? Mm -hmm. We will come back to this in a minute. I'm surprised. In my class, usually the smartphone pop right up before I can finish a sentence. Yes, ma'am, tell me. All right, so... Uh, all right, the, the big red one you're looking at that's there, King. that's King. Mm -hmm. Under that's Pierce. Mm -hmm. Kind of that triangle on the lower left, that one is Thurston. This is Thurston. Yeah. Yes. All right, that's what we need to know. One more. This is to let you know where people are coming from and also the numbers. I'll give you a little bit of um, some statistics around where people are from and, uh, and the percentage. Would y'all have imagined this to be the breakdown in terms of the top 15 countries of birth here in King? Not here in like King, but in Washington. Would you have thought that? Mexico, the Philippines, Vietnam? Nope. Where would you have thought? Let me tell you the numbers here. This is 85%. This is 6.8, I mean, sorry, this is 25%. This is 6.8%. From Vietnam is 6.1%. So Mexico is 25%? Yes, 25.8%. The Philippines, 6.8%. Vietnam, 6.1%. India, 5.3%. And China is uh, 5.7. And Carol, question. Uh, the migration from Canada, some of those would also be perhaps Filipino, Vietnamese, Chinese. No, but no, no, a birth. Oh, a birth. Not of origin, but yes. a birth. Okay, thank you. A birth. No, that's a good question. That's because what John, is, John Martinez is referring to is secondary migration and a lot of border countries have secondary migration. One of the little known secondary migration is of Chinese people to Cuba and then to Florida. Mm -hmm. They have a big uh, tradition there. So this uh, allows for us to see where people are from and why it matters when we talk about the diversity in our areas. So how do we decide what's the proper level of legal migration flows? Well, the decision-making process is bifurcated and messy. Bifurcated and messy. The federal government decides the conditions of who can enter and who can leave and if they can come back. Yet the 50 individual states decide to a large degree what happens to immigrants or newcomers, as I like to call our newcomers. They decide what people can do when they're here. So this jurisdictional authority is always a struggle between the federal government and state level. Local communities, they want to have more of a say in the way their communities are affected. But at the national level, the federal government, government wants to maintain jurisdictional authority. But due to the recent spike in immigration on the national level, which we saw was 13%, um, a lot of states have been involved with the process of trying to do the same thing that the federal government only has the right to do. So there's an organization called the Nas National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Conference of State Legislatures, and they track 
all, a lot of the activity around anything that's happening on the state level. One of the main things they track is immigration laws that are passed by the 50 states as well as by um, Puerto Rico and Guam and other places. So in 2014, 171 laws were passed uh, on issues such as human trafficking, health, education, driver's license. Now to put this in perspective, in 2013, I mean 14, these figures were down by 34% from the state legislative activity of the year before. Now, what does this mean for California? I mean, not for California, but for Washington citizens and denizens? It means that this is the new us. This is the new us, y'all. And what I mean by this is the new us is that we are in the midst of a, a, a new migration that's similar to the earlier 20th century, and we have considerations about who can be here, how they can be here, and for how long, and we've got to figure out how can we make this work. Because underneath all of that is about being and belonging. How do we make it work? Because we all want to be and belong here. We are no longer just a Pacific Northwest state we're waking up to the reality that we're a border state. We're waking up to the reality that we're a border state. A lot of people, when they think of Washington, they don't think of us as a border state. They see Space Needle, they see Orcas. What else might they see? Starbucks. Starbucks. <laughs> but when you say border state, you think of, what states do you think of when you say U.S. border state? Arizona, Texas, Florida, New York. And that they have nothing in common with us, or we have nothing in common with them. But that's not so. We are as you can well see here. Not only geographically, but geopolitically, and also because of the wide diversity of those who, who want to be and belong in this community. So we're no longer the Pacific Northwest. We're a border state that happens to be in the Pacific Northwest. We also need to address uh, how we are to be in community. So cities, counties, and neighborhoods are becoming more diverse racially, ethnically, and income-wise. So we have to figure out how our governing institutions are going to address the need to adapt to these changes. So, for example, City of, of Seattle provides relevant public information for denizens so they can vote and do other kinds of things in terms of participating. How many languages do you think it is? It's a lot, but how many? 10, 15, 30, 30 languages. 30 languages, this is the City of Seattle. Now, in order to address the specific challenges of our denizens, we have been experiencing, who have experienced dislocation, the City of Seattle has created a commission of immigrants and refugees. Uh, and this, uh, and the city has also joined this fractious debate about deportations with um, some laws that they passed just recently. One is in 2013 called the Don't Ask Ordinance, so that public um, uh, public workers whether they're law enforcement or other kinds of public workers, cannot ask our denizens who happen to be unauthorized, who, who they, we might presume to be authorized, we can't ask anybody's citizenship status before we send 911. Also, uh, in last year, 2014, City Council passed a resolution. This one, let me give you the numbers because you might want to know. It's 31539. Resolution 31539. And I'm going to read what the resolution states. It says, a resolution prioritizing family unity and urging President Obama and Congress to replace the enforcement-oriented federal immigration system with an immigration policy that keeps families together and respects the right of all workers to support their families. So even on the municipal level, communities are taking a stand as to what they think means to be to be and belong in the United States. We might not be able to say who can come and who can leave, but we're trying. One on the on in Olympia, this is what we're doing. State legislators in the, just January passed the resolution not passed a bill. Well they proposed a bill, but we don't know if it's passed yet. Let's see what happens. It's Bill 1716. Bill 1716. And this bill is called Washington State Family Unity Act, Washington State Family Unity Act. 
and it's to stop local law enforcement agencies from collaborating, yeah, I said it, collaborating <laughs> with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, in the removal and deportation of Washington non-citizens who might have faced the prison system in one way or another, traffic ticket, child support. And I'm going to stop here because I've been talking a while. We've been talking about half an hour. I want us to, there's one other piece of legislation that's on the federal level, but we can talk about it a little while from now. It's about workers in terms of those who are H1B status, the so-called highly skilled, but I don't like to use the phrase high skilled, low skilled, but it may be high wage earners because all of us would like to be high wage earners. It allows for those, the, the spouses of these high wage earners to be able to work. There are a lot of ethical and moral and legal considerations in that. What if you uh, are with your spouse and y'all divorce you in this country? What if you just want to work because it's your right as a worker to, to work with? So, um, that's on the table right now in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. So I want to start by saying that um, being a belonging is very dear to my heart. It's dear to a lot of people's hearts. We just may not think about it when we think about immigration policy reform. But what we want to reform is to improve the ability for us to be and belong in however we want to uh, uh, consider to be community, whether it's here in Seattle Central, Seattle proper, Washington State, and here in the United States. Thank you, and are there any questions? Person will, is authorized mm -hmm. while a denizen 
this person maybe belongs to that place, but mm -hmm. that person is not authorized. That person may or may not be authorized. <coughs> uh, and um, but the challenge is we have we are always struggling about what it means to belong. In the United States, um, people of African descent were not considered to be citizens. Asian Americans too. And Asian Americans too. And the and the Chinese Exclusionary Act in 1881 refers to that that you could not own property, and that if, if you were Chinese national or and and had and your children were born here, mm -hmm. that was contested as well as to whether they were U.S. citizens. Um, so okay, I am an international student, mm -hmm. and um, so when I came to the U.S. Embassy in Ho Chi Minh, in mm -hmm. Ho Chi Minh City, to uh, you know to you know request a visa, my dad he told me that I cannot request a visa with my Vietnamese passport because. Like my stay only lasts for a year. While if I request a visa with my French passport, yes, I have two passports, mm -hmm. uh, then I will be here for five years. So why is that? Is, does, it, does it have anything to do with the fact that Vietnam is a communist country and French is a, an ally to the state? We do have different kinds of, uh, um, of relationships uh, with different countries in terms of the number of people who can come mm -hmm. and, 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 and then what their status might be. But there's some long-standing history um, behind uh, the relationship between Vietnam and the United States. We, uh, I mean, it used to be that many people who came to the United States uh, from Vietnam could claim refugee or asylum status. Mm -hmm. And so that's one part of the complication of uh, that history between the United States and, and Vietnam. Now, um, when it comes to the particulars, uh, what's happening in 2015 with Vietnam, st Vietnamese stands I can't speak to, because the law is big and broad. Mm -hmm. But yes, what you're referring to is, are there differences in terms of who can enter, given the history that the United States mm -hmm. may have with that country? And yes, there mm -hmm. is. Yes? Also on regarding that, sometimes those, those, law, those time limits are reciprocal. Mm -hmm. Both mm -hmm. nations apply them equally to each other. So many times it's, it's got kind of a relationship. It can be closed or open. Mm -hmm. This one is Blair. Uh, I have kind of two questions, kind of one, maybe just related. Um, so uh, we were talking about the beginning when you were talking about 1965, how the immigration was kind of centered around family unity. But I think kind of over time, the, the focus goes to like taxes and jobs, and uh, we kind of lose the the, the family unity piece of it. So my question is, how do we either change the conversation or find some middle ground, or how do people who have citizenship or are aware of its importance um, be a good ally to those who don't? Like, how do we start those conversations with people who aren't necessarily sold on immigration? Yes, um, the the pendulum has uh, always swings back and forth as to whether we want more expansive immigration policy or more restrictive immigration policy, whether it's for people who are refugee, uh, refugee status, asylum status, legal status, and from, what, from different parts of the world. We move back and forth. And then, of course, and I'm not trying to walk around that, what might be considered an elephant in the room, those who are of unauthorized status. But I, I, I approach that carefully because the notion of unauthorized status is um, is um, malleable. It, it can change really quickly. And so uh, what I think it would be very important is for us to interrogate deeply what we mean by illegal and legal status so that we can start dismantling that as a point of departure when talking about people of irregular status. That would be the first thing to do. And then the second would be for us to, because I've thought about this deeply, Another one is, is for us to look at the notion of moving across borders is a human right in our country uh, and, uh, and also across um, the, the world. We think of the movement of goods and services as something that's possible and doable, but then we want to problematize the movement of peoples across borders. Now, I'm not saying that any and everybody should move in, in where they want to, but uh, and without any, uh, 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 without any repercussions of thinking about new newcomers and old timers, but to make those kinds of restrictions around notions of legality, illegality, deportation, 
notion of sexual orientation as being a condition of whether you would be able to enter it. Changing the, the definition of what's considered moral turpitude, we used to have that as a condition that you couldn't come into this country. Moral turpitude used to be those who were engaged in, uh, let's say, sexual activity. But now we know that human trafficking, there will be some people who would be uh, automatically deported because of the notion of moral turpitude. And then we include into that categorization, if you had a um, traffic violation uh, and then maybe got a little uh, testy with the police officer when you were arrested, if you had a traffic violation. So that's what I mean, those, uh, those categories change. We, we, you all, all of us, if we take time to find out what is going on in our city level, our state level, then we can get, a, and, and the definitions that are used, that will help us to be able to deal with immigrant incorporation. And then we can put pressure on in Washington, D.C., around immigration considerations, conditions for entry. Is that helpful? Because you were talking about the two. Uh, may I ask the gentleman behind me? Before? Yes. Hi, my name is Roberto. Hi, Roberto. Um, I have this concept. I don't, I don't know if it's correct or not, uh, but it seems to me that in order to have access or authority or authorization to go to the United States, you have to have assets. Is that true for all of um, the, the countries around us? Because I'm from Mexico, we had to we had to show proof of, of uh, property and, and or you know just stuff like that. So um, is that that's not true for everyone because there are different conditions for entry. Mm -hmm. And I hope y'all use this because it's, it's value free when we use the word conditions for entry, and then we can interrogate where the, it, that, where the value is. Well, the notion of if one has political refugee status mm. or asylum, you know, asylum seekers, uh, you don't have to show conditions of it. You know, you have to show that you have assets. Uh, some, um, if you're a student, you don't have to necessarily show that. But in a sense, you're kind of, you're, you're an asset to the country, uh, yes. being a student and seeking knowledge. So now let's, then, then let's talk about the real deal on this. Mm -hmm. This country, we are always concerned about who can add to us. Mm -hmm. Not what we can do yes. to the world. So we, 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 we really wrestle as the state and then as, a, as communities we wrestle with this notion of what does it mean to be a newcomer and what does it mean to be a member. A member. So we, we believe that this is a place where anyone can come here and be a member, except when it really happens. And then we start thinking about under what conditions will this person either be in conflict in terms of uh, uh, jobs, uh, resources around education. The dreamers among us and those who are of deferred action because they were childhood arrivals, they are wrestling with these same considerations that on one hand, we want to be a, a, an inclusive community, but on the other hand, our history is dark with that, that we aren't, we are very exclusionary. But not nearly as exclusionary as a lot of other countries around the world. I mean, this is a place where if you are born here, I'm mean, going to have to bring that to our attention. A lot of countries, you have three and fourth generation persons who are born in a place that do not have citizenship status, no, membership no, status. Yes, and, uh, and so it's, you are considered to have birthright by blood, not by virtue of being born here. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What, what are the first words that come to mind when you evaluate uh, Bush as an immigrant and immigration uh, policies president and Obama as an immigrant and immigration policy? What, what are the first words that come to mind? Non cuss words. Okay. <laughs> expediency and expediency. Expediency on both presidents' part. Uh, I felt uh, President Bush is from Texas, and Texas has a uh, um, a uh, Janus face. I don't know if you've ever heard of the phrase Janus. It means you have two faces. Mm -hmm. oh, not necessarily phony. Not that this should go in the river.
I'm going to sleep through this. There you go. usually means it's a face that looks forward and a face that looks backward. Texas is a significant border state. It has, has always had a um, relatively uh, sanguine um, perspective about crossing of the borders from uh, Mexico to the United States. California, on the other hand, has a very, uh, is, has a deep animosity, deep animosity of, of migration across the U.S.-Mexico border. The Janus face in Texas is that they did, because it's also convert, a conservative state, and conservatives tend to not want, I mean, tend to not want expansive policy, they want restrictive policy. It meant that those in Texas had to figure out how can we have expansive policy but look like we don't have expensive, but that we're supporting restrictive policy. So I guess it is kind of like two things. Right. But, I mean, that's a struggle that they have. Now, where, who was asking the question? Yes. So, out of expediency, President Bush would have, he would uh, absent his, himself out of certain conversations and allow uh, other Republicans to carry on that discourse around um, whether we would have exp uh, expansive policy or not out of expediency, because he was from Texas, he understood. But, but the president, but President Obama also is acting out of expediency, or until now, because he's, he doesn't have another, he doesn't have another term. But he really was not as friendly as he could have been to those who were experiencing unauthorized, the, the repercussions of unauthorized policy or the, the uh, the fluidness of uh, immigration status. He could have been a lot more upfront in his first administration. And even maybe the first year of his second administration. And I just think it was a matter of expediency. So that's the word that comes to my mind for both presidents. Yes, ma'am. I think Jim's wife is an immigrant, isn't she? Or a migrant? Okay, but you know what? Um, the, the American exceptionalism also refers to states. So, American exceptionalism means that we believe that we are so unique that certain things don't apply to us when it comes to being the nation of opportunity. It applies to, well, Texas thinks it's an exceptional state, and so does Florida. So if you become naturalized in Florida or Texas, the notion is these other things don't really apply to you. So even though he might have a, 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 a wife or a spouse who's a naturalized person, these considerations, um, because of the history of, of Florida, it, uh, they don't have the same notion as you would have in California. Where if you're naturalized, you still are thought of as somebody who's an outsider. Still thought of as somebody who's an outsider. Yes, ma'am. Um, so May. 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 As in May. May. Um, so I am doing a paper on terrorism, and so and yesterday I just read an article by the Washington Post that said. Um, well, terrorists, the trend lines in the phenomenon of terrorism has been worse than ever. And um, they said something about there is this new flood of foreigners who volunteer for ISIS, who volunteer to be terrorists. And those foreigners, they have, kind of, you can say, unlimited access to Western countries, such as the states or the EU. So will that affect the reforms of U.S. immigrant policy? Since the very first Immigration Act was the Alien and Seditions Act in, uh, at the inception of our country, the notion of terrorists, fifth columnists, foreign influence on our national, in our national body politic is not a new consideration. It's not a new consideration. It is one of the reasons why we had um, our first immigration. So it's always been a part of our conversation. When we were, we're addressing workers and the role of workers in having a say in their rights for uh, how long they could work, who could work, those individuals were, were labeled as terrorists, fifth columnists, seditious. It rears its ugly head the notion of if you have the freedom of speech, thank you for coming, I appreciate your, your, your uh, question.
you exert your freedom of speech, you could easily consider a terrorist. I'm not, no, I'm not discounting that um, we may have internal, um, you know, something to worry about internally, but oh, every country does. But for us to conflate that, which is what Blair's worried about, to conflate that with our overall conversation about uh, who should be here and why and who we should be worried about, it's a tantamount to, to profile. Tantamount to, to profile. Yes? Does, does that kind of go along with one of the questions that my grandfather had to answer when he came from Czechoslovakia? Are you an anarchist? Yes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, my grandma, grandma might have been conditioned for not coming in. Yeah, I mean, small I'm, towns and yes. poverty, and yeah, the question is, are you an anarchist? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. These people are not Yes. And there were also other profiles. Uh, there was a, a vicious campaign against uh, Chinese women being prostitutes. Yes. Right. Moral turpitude. Very vicious campaign against mm -hmm. Chinese women immigrants. Mm -hmm. So we have to guard against that. That's one of the things that makes um, the need for freedom of speech to be something a part of and parcel of our discussion about being and belonging. And uh, with that in mind, if we don't have any more questions, I thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Again, let's thank Dr. Hunt for her time and her insight.